Okay, so, um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we, we're going to open up for discussion. Uh, it isn't necessarily a, a kind of a, um, kind of a, what do you call it, a, a question and answer kind of session. It's really just a discussion session, right? So please feel free to make comments, or, um, to uh, ask questions, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, so um, it's really an opportunity for us to share. And uh, so what, what we'll do is take, uh, perhaps, let's just take three uh, comments, questions, and so on. And then I'll ask uh, Michael to come forward and, uh, and, take, on, uh, and take those on. Um, show of hands. Is it, if you could move closer, that would be nice. I, mean, I see Jenny's trying, but uh, South Africans are so... South Africans are either shy or they obstinate. I don't know what it is. <laughs> yes, please. Just, uh, just mention who you are, where you, which, where you're from, and then. Uh, just hang on a second. Do we have a, ro a, ro a roaming mic or something? Yeah. Okay. There's one coming. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. Thank you. I'm Matiti Madiba from University of Pretoria. Very inspiring. My question is, how do you manage to rally around uh, the different sectors of the institution to unite in the mission? Um, because as conversations have been going, you have uh, faculty staff, you have your uh, administrators, you have your people in support services or student affairs, and many a time we are not able to join our forces in driving the student success mission. We become so divided that we shoot ourselves in the foot. How did you get it right? Okay, that's a great question, thank you. Just, uh, let's take two or three. Yeah. Another one, yeah, go ahead. Good morning, my name is Mkoli Simasango, I'm from VETS. I think this was quite an interesting discussion. Uh, in terms of the student numbers, could you please just share with us uh, what is the current student number at, at the college and as, as well as the staff complement? I think that would be an interesting piece. Thank you. Uh, student, the student numbers and the staff, uh, the staff that you have. Oh, number of people. Number of people, okay. yeah. One more? This, this one was Bernard, so welcome. Thank you, a very inspiring presentation. I just want to check with you. My name is Bernard, I'm from Investor Vendor. I think in the main, what you share with us was about how you were able to change, you know, culture of how things were done and to the way that you wanted to be done. And you do know that, you know, in changing a culture is quite very difficult. So just maybe to share some practical stories in terms of how do you, you went around changing these cultures, you know, to ensure that, you know, you're aligning to what you wanted to do. Okay. So by the way, Bernard uh, didn't finish. He's, he's uh, the vice chancellor or president of the University of Vienna. Ah. Okay. Welcome. Okay. I guess, right. thank you. Over to you. All right. So if, if I am keeping track of this, um, thank you, correctly, I've got two questions on culture and one on the number of people. Is that, is that right? And just because I, I believe in giving all voices a chance to be heard, um, are there other areas outside of these two that folks would just like me to touch on briefly? Or with these, yes ma'am. priority of institutions yet. I find that mental health still seems to become the responsibility of student affairs, and yet it, it poses institutional risks. Um, how, did you, how did you do that? How did you get the institution to commit to prioritizing mental health? Anything else? 
right, well, he goes there. I'll go here. Cause. <laughs> I'll go first. Okay. Um, thank you for your presentation. My name is Mpo. I'm from Wits University. I just have two questions. The first question, if you could please just expand on your digital um, mastery program. Um, what does that program entail? And did you say there's certificates every three to six months? If you could just please explain that. And then also, do you have a program, excuse me, I'm not sure with the terminology, but for your first time entrance to the college, do you have a particular program for those students to kind of integrate them from, we call it high school, I'm not sure what you might refer. Okay, all right, thank you. Okay, <laughs> that's lovely. <laughs> so, um, inequality and poverty compromises human rights and human dignity. And in our context, and I'm sure in your context as well, it, it gives rise to all kinds of social ills, which then moves from society into the college arena. So you have to deal with bullying and prejudice and racism, sexism, um, homophobia, all kinds of things. And that's been really a big part of our college life. And because we've come from apartheid, we've never had the systems in place to deal with human rights at the college level. Um, so in terms of governance and management, we didn't have those policies, procedures, human capacity, offices in place. And it emerges as a huge issue. Because he's starting to walk towards okay. us. Okay. So, right. oh, no. so, so, it. so it's do you have the same problem? How do you deal with it? Okay. All right. That's it. it. Uh, you, I'm going to talk to afterwards. So I'm going to. All right. Any. Okay. All right. One more. And what's yours, sir? And it's got to be short. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Ndozo Pim. I'm from the Council on Higher Education. Uh, um, the area which I'm interested in, I've seen uh, the marvelous work that you've done as a school and the community in integrating the two. In South Africa, we have what we call community uh, uh, engagement uh, within all our institutions. And so far, I think uh, we haven't aced, aced it that uh, we have fully integrated in terms of programs going back and forth. Uh, based on a number of reasons. One being uh, uh, the, the, the capacity versus academic staff, uh, administration and support, and the amount of workload that they have. And which brings me to my point, in terms of uh, the arrangement of your institution uh, support staff and uh, your academic staff, and also the approach that you have. Do you have a designated office which actually facilitate that integration and community project, or is it an institutional wide approach in terms of addressing that? That's a great question. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to run through these um, as quickly as I can. And let me just say this. I will wait around and answer questions from people as long as you have them. So if I don't do it here, I'm happy to stick around and, and answer your questions. Um, the first thing that I think is a common thread that all of us have to understand is this is about leadership, right? I mean, just. Very simply, we, we have something called the four L's at Paul Quinn College, our guiding principles. We tell people that you have to leave places better than you found them, that you have to live a life that matters, that you have to love something greater than yourself, but you also have to lead from wherever you are. Right? We don't concede that the only people that get to make decisions are myself or other members of the cabinet. We all have the power to create the environment that we want to see. Now, it is easier when the president says, this is who we're going to be. But all of us have a role to play in that. We never could have developed an ethos of we over me if people hadn't actually bought into the idea that we would be stronger together than we would be apart. That we had a common goal that we could accomplish. And that slogan, that ethos is on our walls. It, it has proven to be a really wonderful rallying point. And I would tell you that you have the ability to articulate visions for your institutions of selflessness, of being more than just institutions of higher education, of being community-based organizations that really speak to the needs of the people. 
And then you have to preach it, right? You have to continuously preach. Like this is not something that you say at a, at a school gathering one time and then it just magically takes hold. You have to repeat it to people over and over again. Then you have to provide examples of how that allows you to succeed. I mean, listen, 10 years ago, the idea that the president of Paul Quinn College would be speaking in South Africa would be unheard of. Because 10 years ago, we weren't sure we were still going to be around. right? But what my staff, what my students, what our community has been able to see is what happens when you stop being focused on just yourself. Everything that we have become, every success we have had, has been because we have put others' interests and their needs ahead of our own. Because we stop thinking small. Maybe the best way I can explain this is when you are in poverty, and institutions can be in poverty. We were an institution that was just enveloped by poverty. You have a tendency to only think about yourself. And so you're just always asking people for things because you're thinking, I don't have enough. You, you subscribe to a culture of scarcity. We rejected that culture of scarcity. And the farm allowed us to give a physical manifestation of that. Because by growing the food and giving chunks of it away, what we were saying to people is, we have so much that we can share with others as well. And that reframed how people saw us. And, and that simple act turned out to be powerful. So I would tell you, if you want to change your culture, expand your culture. Expand your reach. You don't have to take our ethos of we over me, but find one that represents a galvanizing call to your community. That works. And then you just have to keep repeating it. Um, number of people. So we're a small institution right now because the way that the rules are written on work colleges, we couldn't become a work college unless we had more than half of our people living on campus. And we were out of housing. So we were building our first new buildings in 40 years right now, the first of which is a new dormitory. Um, so we can expand that. Part of the reason why we've been expanding to open other campuses is it allowed us to change the definition of on-campus experience, which then allowed us to grow. But the other thing is we have no aspiration of being 10,000 student institutions. We are scaling a small college experience. We want each of our institutions to have 1,500 to 2,000 students because we think that there is something special in that number. Students that are coming from marginalized places are used to not being seen and not being heard. If you put all of them in 10,000 institutions, school, 10,000 people schools, they still aren't seen and they still aren't heard. <coughs> Smaller institutions allow you to pour deeply into their lives in a way that large institutions don't. So we're scaling that small college experience. Um, staff is an interesting one because remember, all of our students are working. So we have hired a bunch of our students as our staff members in the day to day because that's part of how we help pay them. So on paper, it may look like we have 50 full-time employees, when in reality, we have over 150 employees, because actually it's probably closer to 250 employees, because our students are working with us as well. They count towards our head count. Um, how do we change culture? Like, because we just changed it, right? I mean, we just rolled up our sleeves and said, this is no longer who we are going to be. And I am telling you, sometimes it starts there. It starts by telling people who you're not going to be, who you're going to be, and then continuously pointing to who you're going to be and who you've become over and over and over again. And that is about staying on message. If you are a leader, you have to embrace this reality. You are part preacher and part politician. You are. And so those same principles from narratives and messaging, they're exactly the same thing. Right? I mean, and, and whatever your relationship with faith is, is okay, but you are still going to be part preacher because you're preaching the gospel of education, right? You have to meet people where they are. Again, meet them where they are, lift them to the places where their dreams should be. And that means you have to reach them any way you can. The mental health piece, life is hard, right? Life is hard. All of us deal with those realities. All of us carry burdens. Part of the way we made the mental health piece accessible 
is I was very personal about it. So <clears throat> what I didn't talk about is about a decade ago, I died and had to be resuscitated. I suffered from something called sudden cardiac death, right? It was a fluke. It should have never happened. Um, but literally, I had a 2% chance of living. And my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, saved my life. And when I recovered, because, you know, when you die and come back, it's a little jarring, okay? It's a little jarring. And, you know, I was a guy, I was a college athlete. I, you know, I've always derived immense strength from my physical strength. And for the first time in my life, I had to be confronted by the fact that I couldn't just physically overcome everything. And that was hard for me. So I suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. And, you know, I got to a place where literally I would get up and go to work and come home, put on like my sleep clothes and just get into bed because I was afraid that I, the next step I would take, I would die. And my wife, you know, finally was just like, I think we have a problem, right? Why don't we go see someone? And, you know, went to a counselor and the counselor was like, you're suffering from mild depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. He said, and by the way, who wouldn't? Right? He's like, you died. You had to be resuscitated. You had a 2% chance of living. It's okay that it's a little hard for you to deal with that. Right? And so I don't expect people to do things that I don't do. And I don't expect people to go places that I won't go. So every year, I stand up in front of my student body, and I talk about that issue. And I tell them that there's a difference between going through things and being trapped by things. The ability to have someone validate the experience I was having released me from carrying that burden with me my whole life. So instead of being trapped in that darkness, I was given back a path to light. And we talk about how you don't have to stay in the dark. And when you do that, when you are willing to be, and that's why I tell you about being authentic. Like, you know, I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to make fun of me? Right? Okay. But that doesn't make me look uncool. That makes you look uncool. And what it has done is given my students permission to talk about it themselves and to be vulnerable, right? Because here's the other thing about leading. Many people think that leaders always have to be the strongest people in the room. Sometimes your strength comes from your vulnerability and being the most relatable person in the room and being strong enough to acknowledge your weakness. And that also can help change cultures. Um, so that's, that's how we addressed the mental health piece. Um, and then we went out and found funding for it. And you know, anyone that wants to talk, I mean, that's a much longer one, but I can talk about that. Um, digital mastery piece. So it is important that we produce students who are capable of navigating life, right? As institutions, all of us know this, the pace of, of technological change is coming so rapidly, we have no idea what world we're preparing our students for. If we are honest, we know we don't know what the world is going to look like in five years. It is especially frightening with artificial intelligence. All right, so in America, there's been a study done that said 40 million people are going to be displaced because of artificial intelligence. 40 million people who probably already are on the cusp of poverty, right? Because if your job can be replaced by artificial intelligence, that means that you're probably on the margins anyway. So what we said was, well, look, why don't we try and prepare the students for the reality of change? That means we have to give them more. So yes, you can give them subject matter mastery, but if we're honest, how many people are doing what they majored in for a career. I majored in government and minored in black studies, right? Now, I'm definitely still black, right? That part turned out to be helpful, okay? But, I mean, I'm not, I went to law school. I don't practice law anymore. I have a master's in public policy. I'm not really doing policy work, right? So I went 0 for 3, okay? It wasn't, I mean, I got a doctorate, right? I mean, luckily something worked, okay? But my point is, that's our students' realities. So 
how many people have the resources to be able to go get four degrees to figure it out, right? I was fortunate. My family did well. I was able to do that. But our students don't have that opportunity. So we have to give them more for where they are now. Subject matter mastery is always going to be there. That's important. That's what you major in. That's critically important. But real-world work experience, experiential learning, that fills in gaps, right? So you need to get them internships where they are able to see enough experiences to draw upon that knowledge. But if we do that and we don't acknowledge the role technology is going to play in their lives on a day-to-day -day basis, then we're not being honest and we're not being who we should be as institutions. So we created this program where it, there's three versions of this, right? So the first is just every course requires students to do something involved in technology, right? But then we got into that and said, we can do better. So then we ramped it up and said, what if every semester students have the opportunity to earn a certificate that they can then operationalize and use to build revenue for themselves? Now, here's why that's important. If you are in, in America, I think the average graduation rate of schools is 35, 40%. So let's say 60% of our students aren't graduating. So 60% of our students are incurring debt to go to school that they can't then benefit from because they don't have the degree. Imagine what happens if every semester, every year that a student is there, they get a certificate that they can use for employment. So, for example, if you are Microsoft Office certified in our country, you can earn up to $70,000 a year. If you earn $70,000 a year, you are out of poverty, right? That is the easiest certificate for students to get. They can get that in one semester. So in one semester of college, because of that certificate, we have allowed you to be out of poverty. And, you know, some really stupid people said to me, well, then why did they go back to school, right? If you can get a job and make $70,000 after one semester, why would they continue to go to school? And I was like, listen, dumb, dumb. If we can get you a $70,000 after one semester of college, imagine what we can do after four years. And he was like, well, I was like, shut up, right? So, because sometimes people are just dumb, okay? You can't be afraid to call them out, all right? But what this certificate program allows us to do is every year you can pick up one to two of those. It starts with Microsoft Office Word, then we work our way up to some coding, then you can also opt for data science. Now data science is gonna take a little longer, right? But the point is we've given you three ways to sort of hedge your bets. And we think that redundancy gives our students the best chance of being long-term successful. Um, all right, Summer Bridge. So a lot of our students come from places that are difficult. Getting them out of those places as soon as for as much as possible while we fortify them and get them out of that trauma-causing environment is important. Summer Bridge allows students to come to school early. They're there right now. I, and by the way, I'm one of the professors in the Summer Bridge program. So I am my student's first college professor. And I think that's important because it changes the relationship that they have with the institution and the leadership of the institution. So they see me not just as President Sorrell, they see me as Prez, their professor, right, who for two weeks probably gave them straight Fs while they got acclimated to college life, right? What they never, and this amazes me, I've been doing this for a decade with the Summer Bridge program. Students get all emotional about the Fs they get for two weeks. And it never occurs to ask, anyone or no one ever occurs to ask, do these grades count towards my final grade? They never count, right? Like the whole 50% of their grade is on class participation. 40% is a group project that's due at the end. I don't count the two weeks of Fs while we're getting acclimated, but they, you should see the emotions that they have. Sorry, it's just a little funny experience we have. Um, but the Summer Bridge program, when we analyzed the data, the common thread was the people who were most successful at Paul Quinn, were the people, like, or the single greatest predictor of success at Paul Quinn was whether or not you went through the Summer Bridge program. 
and are two of the three professors, myself and the Vice President of Academic Affairs. So we don't farm the program out. We put us there. And I'm there, with the exception of this week, I am there four days a week, two hours a day, every morning teaching. Okay, so it says to my students how important they are because that's the kind of investment in time that we make. Uh, and let's see, trauma related. Did I deal with the trauma related? Did that? Okay, and then allocation of resources. So let me just say this. You are never going to have enough. You're never going to have enough. You're never going to have enough time. You're never going to have enough money. You're never going to be at a place where you think you can finally do all the things that you need to do. So you might as well just start doing them. Right? Just start doing them. And you'll be surprised at what happens. We raise more money now than we've ever raised in the history of the institution. And it's because we started doing things, right? I mean, the Wall Street Journal has written about us three times this past year, okay? We have 550 students, all right? That's unheard of. The New York Times has written about us consistently. Um, people come to our campus, former President Bill Clinton came, people asked him, why would you go to Paul Quinn? He said, because this college works the way we think America should work, right? I mean, we decided to stop counting what we didn't have and start embracing the things that we did have. And then we started expanding the vision which gave us access to more resources and more relationships. So we are unbelievable about the partnerships that we build. Our partner on the farm, when we were starting the farm, was Yale University. We, and this is actually how we solve problems, right? We look for great partners who have expertises, and then we partner with them to leverage their expertises and to get better at what we do. And when we find problems, we use their expertise to solve that too. So one of the areas we struggle with, and we still struggle with, to be honest with you, is finding people to help raise money for the school. Because it turns out that, you know, it's not a dream job to come raise money for a small school like ours. <laughs> So we said, well, we can't be the only small school that has this problem. So we designed a major on fundraising and philanthropy to, to train people to become fundraisers. Right? It's one, becoming one of the most popular majors at the school. We partnered with the University of Pennsylvania to do that program. And by the way, they have 600 fundraisers. They're really, really good at it. But there are more schools like ours than like Penn. So if you start identifying holes in the market, fill them, which then creates more resources for you, right? So we, we've done that. Um, our study abroad program, our institutional mission said that we were creating servant leaders who become agents of change in a global marketplace, except no one ever went global, right? So we had this mission that we weren't living up to because we had no global experiences. We sent a group of students to Amsterdam um, several years ago. And we did that because my alma mater, Oberlin College, uh, allowed us to partner with them to send that first group to Amsterdam. And just to show you kind of how our institution works, so we're sending six students to study in Amsterdam. We think it's going to be great. And one of the parents calls me up to one of the students that's going. She said, you know, she said, Prez, you promised my daughter that she'd be able to study abroad before she graduated when you came. And, you know, you have always proven to be a man of your word. She's like, I had no idea how you were going to pull this one off, but you did. She said, but here's the thing. I don't know the people that she's going overseas with. And I was like, oh, they're great people. I know them. They're wonderful. She's like, no, no, I think it's great that you know them. She said, but I don't know them. I know you. So I think you should go with them. And I was like, I'm not planning on going to Amsterdam, right? She's just like, you told me you would always take care of my daughter, and this would be taking care of her. And I was like, it's like you are incredible. Where was I? On a plane to Amsterdam, where I spent a week with the students, getting them oriented and all of that. And it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, 
And, you know, that, that's the thing. I really, really want to hammer home this point. Stop. Stop thinking small. Right? Stop. Stop giving power to the fear of failure. Let's just get this out of the way right now. You are going to fail at some things. Right? If not, then you aren't aiming high enough. We fail at lots of stuff. Right? I mean, we do. Like, like, here's one of my really dumb ideas that didn't work. I thought, hey, why do we have grades? Maybe we don't need to have grades. Turns out you need grades, okay? We went through a period where we tried school with no grades, <laughs> did not work, right? My faculty was looking at me like, yeah, genius. We told you that this wasn't. But you know what? That's fine. It's fine because it turns out it's really valuable for people to see you stumble, right? because they need to see that you have resilience too. They need to see that you know how to keep going. So you know what? No one remembers until I bring it up that we went through a period where we didn't have grades, right? Because it's just, it's the ability to embrace a stumble, right? That's part of innovation. Just stumble, get it over with and keep going. So, um, I think I've covered all the questions. If there are more, uh, you're shaking your head like I didn't. What, what, did I miss your question? Okay, social, all right, so here's the thing. Her question, and she's right, I did not address that, thank you, um, was about the, how do we deal with society intruding upon what should be a safe space, all right? Um, here's the thing. In reality, there are no more safe spaces. And we have to come to understand that. For all the blessings of technology, they have brought some things that have not been great as well. And some of that is how accessible all these problems are. And our students aren't equipped to deal with that. Right? I mean, they have access to too much too soon. And it has broken them. And they do not know how to handle that. And there's nowhere else for that to go but to our campuses. right? Because they're living with us every day for years upon years. And they're living in close proximity to each other. And so, Part of the reason why we decided to turn our institution outward and address it is because it gave us the ability to incorporate that. Otherwise, all we would ever do is just leave it in a department, which goes back to the gentleman who talked about like the community affairs and community engagement piece of this. You have to construct your institution in a way that is broader, right? And so for us, we know the students are so we try and give them more avenues to express their frustrations. Uh, we aren't afraid of hearing their frustrations. Um, part of the reason why I teach, and this wasn't why we started out this way, but it's been a benefit, is it changes my relationship with those students. So when they're angry, they know that they have an outlet. They know that I will listen to their voices. That even if it's messy, even if they're angry with me, I'm like, listen, you don't, like, you have the right to be angry with my decisions, right? Now, let's talk about how we manage that anger because we have to manage it in a way that is productive for all of us, not destructive. But you can't have that conversation if you haven't laid the groundwork. And we lay the groundwork and we provide examples. So here, here's, we dealt with an issue last spring where we had a small group of angry students and a small group of angry staff that had been fired, right? Because someone asked me about what you do with people who aren't there for the right reasons, and we don't really like those people, right? So they usually wind up having a short career at the college, but they become angry, right? And so, you know, it's, today is the age of social media, so folks tried to get a social media presence attacking me, right? And so, you know, there are lots of ways you can respond to that. You can try and root out those individuals and try and punish them. I think that's just ridiculous. 
Or you can just pull the cover off them because they didn't want to be identified. So I said, well, look, why don't we just deal with the issues, right? So if these are issues people are talking about, why don't we just talk about them? So I have town hall meetings at least twice a year, <clears throat> one each semester, and many times more than twice a year, where I stand up in front of the entire student body, and we just talk about the issues that they have. And we talked about that. And I said, so I understand that some of you are really angry. I said, I get it. It's like, so let's talk about what you're really angry about. And then methodically went through all of the issues that people had raised that I had heard about. And it literally was just a case of people not being completely honest, right? And so we started an academic community. It was an experiment that we had high hopes for that just didn't work. And they said, well, you know, you guys put the students who are struggling off in a separate apartment complex, and you didn't do this, 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 and this for them. And we're like, OK. I was like, let's talk about that. We put them in a dedicated living community, just like we've done with other groups of students. We hired three additional staff members to be there to care for them 24 hours a day. In addition to that, we gave them the same scholarship that everyone else gets for working and then didn't ask them to work. But see, no one had told the students that part of it, right? And once students heard, they were like, wait a minute. You did all that, and they're getting the same scholarship all of us got? And they don't have to do the work? Uh, it was over at that point, right? But I had the credibility because my students knew me, right? And so a lot of it is just taking the time. And this, this goes back to a little bit what you and I were talking about outside and you know she asked me do you hire psychologists or do you hire teachers and I said well you, you gotta hire both but you better make sure you understand that you gotta hire psychologists right mm -hmm. I mean I think we, we we have tended to believe that the academy is only about teaching and it's only about teaching in a traditional sense and what we do at Paul Quinn and this goes to the point about community engagement our entire institution teaches, right? We don't concede any part of it. And we tell all of our staff, you too have a role to play in the education, right? Because students are in class for a relatively small amount of the time that they are in your institution. So if you think that everyone doesn't have a role in teaching and reinforcing your messages, you are sadly mistaken, right? Like, you need everyone to help because we cannot concede any time. So we view everyone as a member of the teaching instrument. And everyone also is trained to help with the other societal importance part. And in terms of the community engagement, we all have the responsibility to engage, all of us. And I empower my staff to do that. I'm like, listen, if I'm the only one that shows up at community meetings, one, I'm going to be running to the ground. But two, that's just, that misses an opportunity for each of you to develop your own voice. Right? So go. Like, go, engage, find issues you're passionate about, and give me an opportunity to support you and give the institution an opportunity to support you. So that's how we try and do those things. Is that, is that better? Did I? All right. Thank you. Um, yes, sir. I've really been inspired by your talk. In the, I'll be in Texas in July. I'd love to visit your new campus that you're saying you've opened there. Yes, yes. And then my question is on the travel abroad, abroad requirement. Will this be a compulsory requirement? You have indicated that your students come from poor backgrounds. If that is the case, what support system are you putting in place to make sure that your students will meet that requirement? Great question. Thank you. So this is just about creatively addressing issues, right? So part of the reason we changed the academic calendar when we did was to create a gap of time in December that our students, we were going to do something called a December term. Now, 
it took us a number of years to be, get to this point because we had to build capacity in other areas, right? But we now have a gap of time that is available from Thanksgiving until Christmas. Many of our students could never afford an entire semester abroad. But they can afford two weeks, right? Two weeks becomes manageable. Now, do you access every experience that you would have in a whole semester? No. But you know what? If you've never been outside of your state or your city or your neighborhood, do you know how stressful it is to travel abroad? I mean, look, the first few times I went abroad, I was sort of like, you know, is, is this going to be OK? Right? And I was a grown man who grew up in a family with plenty of resources, who had traveled. But the first time you're somewhere by yourself, that's a different, right? So we've shortened the amount of time. They can go for a semester or they could go for two weeks. The other thing we did is in America, we have Native American communities, right, who have been treated horribly by our country. Um, but each of those Native American tribes are considered sovereign nations. And those sovereign nations, many of them have tribal colleges. Many of them also have reservations. So that qualifies as studying abroad because you're visiting another nation. So for many of our students who might not be able to be comfortable traveling overseas, you can go to Oklahoma, which is the state right next to Texas, and visit the Cherokee tribe there, that qualifies. So it's, it's giving people permission to crawl before they can run. Right? Now, do I think that every student is going to say, ah, oh, I'm just going to go to study abroad in Montana on the Native American reservation? No. Like already, this summer, we have students in Spain, Ghana, um, Argentina, uh, London, and I'm missing someone. Oh, in South Africa, there's someone in Cape Town. I was like, why? So um, last summer, we had students in Germany, in London, in Japan. Uh, we sent students to Amsterdam. I mean, so that culture is starting to permeate itself. Um, but that's how we do it. And then with faculty-led trips, that's a difference. So like, we, we challenge the students to raise their own money, but you know, we fill in the gaps, right? Like, I mean, I, the student who came to South Africa was about $500 short, so she magically got a President Sorrell $500 travel scholarship that allowed her to go study abroad, right? I mean, all we ask is that you give us everything you have and then let us help you once you've proven that you're really doing the work. So, all right, is it the... All right. Well, thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you so much.